Hello, hello, hello. This is Morel Bernard with Study Coach UK channel on YouTube. And I have a new story for you. And the story is about, well, there's a fire. There's burning taking place at Brooklyn. So, there are a few words I want to cover first before we start the story. First word is catastrophe. Catastrophe. Mm. And the other word I want to have a look at is calamity. So, calamity. Catastrophe. Catastrophe. C A T A S T R O P H E. I'll spell it again. C A T A S S for sugar. Yes. T R O P H E. Catastrophe. What on earth does that mean? Well, it's an event that cause great damage. So in the story, there is a catastrophe. An event cause a great damage. Great, great suffering can be caused if there is a catastrophe. A disaster. That's what catastrophe is all about. And the word calamity is often associated with catastrophe. Calamity. C-A-L-A-M-I-T-Y. C-A-L-A-M-I-T-Y. Calamity. 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 (laughs) Calamity. An event. An event causing sudden damage or distress. And usually there is an emergency. Emergency measures need to be taken to avert a calamity. We think that there's going to be a calamity. What can we do to prevent, to avert the calamity? So, in the story, about burning at Brooklyn. There is a catastrophe, a calamity. So let's now go and find out and see what happened in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn, by the way, is Brooklyn in the USA, United States of America. The destruction of the Brooklyn Theatre on the night of Tuesday, December the 5th, was the most terrible calamity of its kind that has occurred in this country. What was first deemed to be an ordinary fire, naturally involving serious financial loss to the owners, the Lysees and the actors was really a catastrophe of the most heart-rending character causing, as it did, the loss of upwards of 300 lives. 300 lives. No theatre fire on this continent had so much horror lent to it. Even the most stone, stony-hearted were touched by the awfulness of this great calamity. 300 human beings of both sexes and of all ages were thrust into eternity through an agonizing, agonizing and painful death. They were thus doomed at a moment of pleasure and mental excitement over the mimic troubles of the dramatic personages in a play, possessing features that touch the hearts of those who followed the scenes on the stage. 
at a moment when every eye was fixed on the painted scene and every ear strained on the utterances of the several characters, the dreadful cry of fire was raised. And in a few moments after, the entire building was filled with flame and smoke. And hundreds of men, women and children were suffocated and burned to death and their charred and disfigured remains buried beneath the ruins. Oh, this is a sad story. Such is the simple and terse record of this most dreadful occurrence. And these few sentences afford such outline and visible form to the picture that it is scarcely needs the shocking details that necessarily follow to give it colour and ghastliness. That so much horror should attend the burning of a theatre, send a thrill of pain through every heart in the land. The full scope of the calamity and the dreadful scenes attending it are depicted in the accounts that follow. No more awful moment can be imagined than that when the fire was discovered. The full moon of the fatal evening had tempted upwards of 1,200 people from their homes and lighted them to the brilliant entrance of the theatre. The famous play of the two orphans with an excellent cast, mainly from the Union Square Theatre of New York City, was the attraction, and had renewed its fascination over a public long since familiar with its story. The audience was characteristically a Brooklyn gathering. Many well-known citizens were there, among them the family of Mr. William C. Kingsley, the Honourable Henry C. Murphy, Edgar Cullen and ladies, E. B. Dickinson and ladies, and Henry Beam. With the exception of Miss Morant, Miss Vernon, and one or two of the minor characters, all the members were in the theatre at the outbreak of the fire. The play had proceeded to the last scene of the last act. The curtain had just been rung up, revealing a scene of exciting and pathetic interest to the audience. It was the interior of the hovel boathouse on the Chien. The blind Louise, that's Miss Claxton, lay on a bed of straw. Mademoiselle Frouchard, that was Mrs. Farron, was scraping a carrot. The cripple was at his wheel, and the jerks was about to emphasise his brutality with a threat. As was natural from her reclining position which enabled her to see the flies, the first flame caught the eye of Miss Claxton. Mr. Murdoch, who played the part of Pierre, was delivering his speech when the two heard a whisper of fire from behind the scenes and looking up saw flames issuing from the flies. Mr. Murdoch stopped, but Miss Claxton whispered to him, Go on, they will put it out. There will be a panic. Go on. And... He resumed. So far, the audience had not noticed anything out of the way, and the two played the scene through. Mrs. Farron of Frichard entering meanwhile. The carpenters were all the while trying to stop the progress of the flames unnoticed by the house. And Miss Claxton 
delivered her little speech to Jerks. I forbid you to touch me, which was greeted with applause. Meanwhile, the audience had begun to suspect something. And with Miss Claxton's words, I will beg no more. The actors were forced to move from fear of falling timber, and the audience rose to their feet. Mrs. Farron and Mr. Murdoch stepped to the floodlights and waved to the people to resume their seats, while Mr. Studley and Miss Claxton went forward to do likewise. Mr. Studley shouted, Ladies and gentlemen, there will be no more of the play, of course. You can all go out if you will only keep quiet. Miss Claxton, at the other end of the stage, begged the people to keep cool, adding, We are between you and the flames. By this time, the fire, which seems to have originated by some of the short drops blowing against the border lights in the flies and so communicating to the scenery, had made so much headway that the actors had to look out for themselves. They had held their ground as long as it was possible, and seen from the panic which started immediately in the gallery, and spread all over the upper part of the house that the worst had begun. They began their retreat, the ground floor being already almost cleared. Mr Thorne had gone. Mr Burrows was upstairs in his dressing room, from which he escaped only to meet his death. Mr Murdoch was never seen again. Miss Claxton and Miss Harrison rushed one way. Miss Gerard and the minor people another. The sight of the fire seemed to paralyse everyone for an instant and just as they recovered sufficiently to act, Mr Studley's suddenly coming to the front of the stage and assuring them that there was no cause for alarm caused another pause of a second. It was for a second only. The blazing fragments began falling thick and fast, contradicting the actor's well-intentioned deception. The audience rose as by one impulse and made a rush for the doors. The entreaties of Miss Claxton and Mr Murdoch were unheeded. The fierce struggle for life had begun. The ushers, for the most part, preserved their presence of mind and endeavoured to enforce order among the rushing crowd, as did also the police in attendance. Mr Rochford, the head usher, broke open a small door at the farther end of the vestibule and increased the facilities of exit into the open air, which regularly consisted of two doors, five feet wide, opening upon Washington Street. Mr Rochford also entered the auditorium and endeavoured to quell the excitement, but without effect. A fire alarm had been immediately sent from the first precinct station house, which is located next to the theatre, and a minute or two after, a general alarm and also a call for the reserve force of all the precincts. But by the time the engines were in position and at work, the fire was beyond control. The occupants of the orchestra chairs and paraquet had had but little difficulty in making good their escape. But at least two-thirds, and perhaps even a larger fraction of the audience, were still in the dress circle and gallery. The lowest estimate of the number in the gallery is that five or six hundred people were in that portion of the house. And from among these were most of the three hundred deaths. 
The exit from the first balcony was down a single flight of stairs in the rear of the vestibule. Down these stairs, the people came in scores, leaping and jumping in wild confusion. The way out from the upper gallery was down a short flight of stairs, starting from the south wall of the building, thence, by a short turn, down a long flight against the same wall to the level of the balcony, and from this floor down a case flight into Washington Street. The main floor and first balcony were soon emptied through their respective exits. But for the five or six hundred panic-stricken gallery spectators to pass safely through the tortuous passage described was next to an impossibility. Every indication points to the belief that, suffocated by the smoke forced them down, a wall from the roof. The mass of those in the upper gallery thronged about the entrance to the stairs and were either blocked there so as to make exit impossible, or were unable even to make the attempt to escape and sank down, one upon the other, to fall in a mass into the horrible pit under the vestibule when the supports of the gallery were burned away. Those near the entrance of the stairs were probably the only ones who were able to escape from this terrible slaughter pen. There was comparatively little outcry here, and this again would seem to indicate that suffocation had intervened to numb the sensibilities of the hundreds to whom death was to come by fire. Do you join me? Join me. Soon I will be back for the next episode, the next audio, the next video, whatever we call it nowadays. But join me for the next audio of Burning of Brooklyn. Join me, Moral Bernard. I'll see you soon for the next episode. Take care. Bye.